Hi, this is Joshua Schmidt coming back to another episode of Financial Friday on the Nerd Assassin podcast. We've been covering The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, trying to get a fundamental base knowledge for economics that we can use to look at different policies and evaluate them. We're really just trying to take a step back to the classical economics. In chapter 11, Adam Smith talks about the rent of land. If you remember, the three components that go into the price of commodities is wages, profit, and rent. So this is the last of the three that we're going to cover. Rent for the use of land is the highest the tenant can afford to pay. This means that the landlord will charge as much as he can, and he'll only leave the tenant enough to make normal profit on costs. This is what we'll define as the natural rent. Somebody might try to argue that rent is just another type of profit, that really the landlord is just making money based on the cost to improve the land. No doubt this can be part of the cost, part of the cost of the rent. However, landlords charge rent on totally unimproved land. Also, usually the tenant's the one that pays for the improvements, not the landlord. And the landlord will still charge for the improvements like he paid for it. Also, the landlord will charge for aspects of land which can never be capable of human improvement. They're not, he's not profiting over the cost to improvement. For example, if you're fishing on the shore, there's nothing the landlord did to bring more or less fish. If you're collecting kelp off a shore or seashells, this rent is there regardless of how much the landlord spent on the land or how much improvements he's done on it. It's really just the price is just a natural monopoly. It's not proportional to the amount that the landlord paid for the land or what he can afford to take. But the only real limit is what the farmer can afford to give. The landlord is going to charge as much as he can and leave the tenant only enough to make normal profits. It's naturally a monopoly price. Rent enters the price of commodities in a completely different way than wages or profits. If you have high wages and or high profits, they'll cause a high price of a commodity. In contrast, if you have low wages or low profits, they're going to cause a lower price for the commodity. If it costs more for me to produce this thing, it's going to cost it's going to cost more to the consumer to buy it. It's pretty self-explanatory. But with rent, it's this whole concept's turned on its head. A high or low rent is the effect of the price and not the cause. If wages or profit are high, that's because that's what's required to be paid to bring the commodity to market. However, if the price is a great deal more, that causes rent to go higher. If the price is low, it causes rent to be low or even not at all. Rent is the effect of the price of the commodity and not the cause. We're going to divide our conversation on rent into these three parts. First, the produce of land, which always affords rent. The second is the produce of land which sometimes does and sometimes does not afford rent. And lastly, we're going to look at the variations of the cost of produce and throughout the progress of society and sort of their relationship to each other. So first, the produce of land which can always afford a rent. Food is always in demand. There's always somebody who will be willing to do something to obtain it. Land produces more food than it takes to maintain the land together with the profits. This is why that it can always afford a rent to the landlord. The amount that he's renting out the land, he can afford to take that because how much is produced on that acre is always more than enough to give profits. The amount of rent that he can charge for the land might vary with the situation or the fertility of the land. 
So for example, for a situation, land near a town will afford more rent because it's cheaper to bring it into town. This is why a good road might be some of the greatest improvements. They break this monopoly. And in breaking the monopoly, they make the food cheaper for the town. It's also good for the people who live in the country because they can bring their food to more markets. And then speaking on fertility for a little bit, an average cornfield, you know, grains that are used to make bread, always is more fertile than the best pasture. It takes, it might take more labor to cultivate corn land, but the yield more than makes up for it. Corn's this annual crop, whereas pasture that I'm using for meat, I can only harvest every few years. So the rent on a cornfield is going to be higher than the rent on pasture in general. I want to key in a little bit on bread and meat because these tend to be the two staples for food. Food being the produce of land which always affords a rent. So in an early state of society, most of the land is in a wild and unimproved state. In this case, meat is really cheap because there's, I can just let my cattle roam. There's nobody to pay rent for that land. There's grass growing up. They can just eat. It's really just labor for me to harvest it. So meat starts out way cheaper than bread. And then as land becomes more cultivated, as I start tilling the land to get it ready for growing grains and corn, that reduces the amount of unimproved wild land that's naturally there to feed the cattle. Eventually, this ends up where a portion of the cultivated land needs to be used for rearing and fattening the cattle. I end up having to use some of the grains to feed the cattle because there's not enough just for them to graze anymore. Once this starts happening, the person renting out unimproved land, he needs to charge to rent it for what he could have afforded converting it to tilled land. So the only way that he's going to keep that pasture for cattle to eat on it is if you give him enough rent for it that it doesn't make it worth it for him to till it and put corn on it. Therefore, as society is improving and this progress of improvement, the rent and profit of an unimproved pasture are regulated in some part by the tilled corn land. Because I'm not going to keep that as an unimproved pasture unless you're going to give me enough rent on it that makes me not want to turn into corn, something that has much more yield than a pasture. And remember, ye meat takes years to be harvested, whereas corn's an annual crop. So you also need to compensate me for not being able to harvest it every year. This is true in general, but there's some local situations which might affect it. For example, if my, the land that I own is really near a town, the town might want more milk and forage for horses, so they might have a preference towards pastures. So they might keep some pastures around because I want a place for my horses to roam or I want some milk that doesn't travel very well. So I might keep pastures around even though it might be more profitable for me to convert it into some tilled land. Or another example is if a whole country becomes populous, it's mostly towns, there may be a preference in that type of country to the few lands that aren't set up for cities that are still farmland to grow more bulky commodities on them. So they might have more land as grass rather than corn because I don't want to have to ship meat across the ocean, but I could import a ton of corn. It doesn't spoil nearly as easy. Here's a quote from Adam Smith that sort of summarizes this. But where there is no local advantage, the rent and profit of corn or whatever else is the common vegetable food of the people must naturally regulate the rent and profit of pasture. So corn regulates the price of a pasture, being that it's the most common vegetable food of the people. We see it in all of our foods, from bread to tortillas to granolas. But together, corn and pasture 
will regulate the price of all other land. If the other crops had some sort of advantage, if I could make a lot more by changing my field from a cornfield into an apple orchard, I would end up converting it or vice versa. If the rent for land on an apple orchard isn't giving me enough money, I'll change it over to a cornfield. There may be crops which look like they make more rent than corn. Some examples that Adam Smith gives is hops or fruit gardens. They look like they're not really, they don't really have this governor of corn land rent. But in reality, these other crops require more money to get the land ready than you would by just tilling it for corn or using it as a pasture. They require more skill and attention, and they're more precarious. So you also have some of the profits going towards what would be the cost of insurance. Usually, all of these don't quite cover all of the profit that you're going to make on that land doesn't quite cover all of these expenses. Because there's also people that like to have vineyards, herb gardens, fruit trees just for fun in their backyard. So these other crops, these more specialty crops, may look like they're not regulated by corn and pastures and tilled land and open fields. But in reality, we're just compensating for these other expenses. Some land is in such a short supply that it cannot supply the effectual demand, even if it was all used for producing that crop. So this is another situation which might make it so that your rent for your land isn't proportional to corn or pasture rent anymore. Instead, it'll exceed it by a lot. Most of the excess price for these types of produces ends up going to rent. The wages and profits are about the same, but a landlord that owns this land is even more of a monopoly, so they end up getting all this excess price. A good example of this is the vineyards of France. In these vineyards on these certain mountainsides, they're the only ones that can grow grapes to make certain types of wine that people like. Burgundy, Bordeaux, these type of wines have a very special area in France. So even if all of that land is used to produce wine, to produce these grapes, there's still going to be more demand. So the prices end up skyrocketing from the scarcity. But in general, in summary, the rent of cultivated land, which produces human food, regulates the rent of other cultivated land. There is no produce of land that can long afford to be less because if there was, that land that's making less than I'd be making with corn would soon be changed over to start making corn, to start making the precursors to bread, or would soon be turned over to make a pasture so I can have more meat. And also, the only way that any land could afford to make more than a corner pasture is because the quantity of land is too small to fill all of the demand, like we talked about with the vineyards. So we talked a lot about corn being the common vegetable to people. It was in England, it was throughout Europe, but could there be a different common vegetable? One example that people might throw out is rice. Rice is the stable crop in some countries. However, even in these countries, the rent of rice land does not regulate other rents because land that's fit for rice, these sort of bogs, these drowned fields, cannot be used for other crops. So I can't quickly turn over rice land and just start growing corn in it or just start growing sugar in it. And also the land fit for other crops. I can't just turn corn fields into rice lands. So it doesn't have the same regulating factor that tilled or pasture land has. One crop that does have the potential to replace corn as the common vegetable, the regulating rent land is potatoes. If it became the most commonly eaten vegetable, 
this would work out because the land that's growing potatoes could grow these other crops. But the chief obstacle for potatoes is that they rot a lot quicker than corn. They're not quite as stable. I can't have them around for a few years. Now we're going to talk about the rent of land that has produce, which sometimes may and sometimes may not afford rent. Human food seems to be the only produce of land which always and necessarily affords rent. Human food's the only one in that first section that we were talking about, where there's always money left over for the landlord. After food, clothing and lodging are the two greatest wants of mankind, sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we're talking about. After I get food, then I can start looking for clothing and lodging, but like food's my number one priority. In the original state of land, the materials that we use for clothing and housing for the lodging are much greater than the number of people that it can feed. In this state, the materials that we use for clothing and housing have little to no value and are often thrown away. Therefore, they can afford no rent to the landlord. Remember we talked about in the beginning, as the price of a commodity goes down, the rent of a landlord can become zero. So some example might be hides and wool um, that we use to, we hunt for food and these are kind of byproducts of that, that I would use for clothing. Once I already have my house established and I have my clothes, they end up being discarded, but I still need to hunt every day. They have little to no value. As land is improved, it can start, it gets to the point where it can feed a much greater number of people than you could supply with clothing and housing, at least in the way that people require and are willing to pay for clothing and housing. I may still be able to supply me with the cheapest clothing and housing. I may still be able to wear a deer hide, but that's not what society really requires or is willing to pay. And at that point, the land can start to afford the rent. So let's look at the example of hides or wool or fur. They're originally discarded as things of no value in an early society. But once foreign commerce is established, even in the rude state of society, these hides, these wools, these furs are kept around and sold off to their wealthier neighbors. And at that point, rent could be charged for the land. There's now something of value on there. So me as the landlord can require that you give me some money for hunting on my property to trap furs. Another example that I think we see more often in the modern age is stone or timber. In North America during Adam Smith's time, when we're talking like the late 18th century, people would happily give wood away just to have it cleared off their property. I just, if you'll cut it down, take it away because then I can change this into a pasture. I could change this into a cornfield. However, large stones, timber can't be transported quite as easily as hide or wool. So foreign commerce doesn't help the rent of land in the same way that hides or wool would. The population of a country can be limited by food, but not by lodging or clothing. In some parts of the world, a house could be built on a single day's labor from one man. Making clothing from skins, likewise, doesn't take that much longer. For an uncivilized society, 99% of their time is spent providing food. They get some of their first kills throughout the year. I can make some clothing. I can make myself some housing. Most of my time is spent providing food. But eventually, as a society improves, one family on its own can provide enough food for two families. At this point, half the population are providing food, and the other half can be employed in providing the wants and fancies of mankind. Adam Smith likes using the necessaries and conveniences of life. A rich and a poor man consume roughly the same amount of food. The quality and time to prepare them might be different, but the quantity is still nearly the same. The desire for food is limited, but clothing, furniture, 
ornaments, all the fancy wants and needs are all the fancy wants are much greater in both quantity and quality for a rich man. They end up buying a bigger house with bigger closets. Not only do they have better clothing, but they have more of it, more cars, quantity and quality go up. There's really no limit or boundary to the desire for the conveniences and ornamental things. At this point, the poor obtain their food that they need from satisfying the desires and amusements of the rich. And then they compete by producing higher quality and cheaper products, thereby improving society further and further. In this way, food may not be the original source of all rent, but every other produce of land derives part of its value from the improvements which produce more food. Let me break this down in another way. If we're able to improve land to feed more people, that frees them up to do other things, to go and build the things that we want and need because they're not spending 99% of their time, like we talked about before, just gathering food, just worrying about food. They can produce more stuff for an improved society, higher quality at a cheaper prices. Even in an improved society, though, these other produces besides human food do not always afford a rent. Remember, we're talking about what does it take for the landlord to be able to charge rent for something? Let's use a coal mine as an example. Coal mines will sometimes be either not fertile enough or in a bad lo location. And this might make it so the person that's actually extracting the coal, the undertaker of the mine, can only pay their own wages or can only pay wages and profit to retrieve it out. So the landlord can't afford to charge any rent. If you remember in the beginning, the natural rent is the rent that the tenant can afford to pay. That's what the landlord will charge. So if the mine's not very fertile and it takes a lot of wages to go down and actually get the coal out, or if it's in a bad location, so transporting them is going to cost a lot, my profits are going to go down, the amount of money I can get on it, and I might only be able to pay wages and profits. There's nothing left for the landlord. Another example that we used earlier was timber or wood, and this ends up working out pretty similarly to cattle. In the beginning, the landlord would gladly give the wood to whoever would cut it down for him. He just wants it off his property. He wants a clearing. As agriculture advances, more and more woods are being cut down to be able to till the till land to make the corn. And or the increased cattle that's running around on pastured land is hindering new trees from growing by grazing on it. Eventually, this causes wood prices to raise up as there's a shortage of it. As there starts to be not enough timber for me to be able to build my boats and to build my housing, it's going to cause the prices to raise. At this point, me as the landlord, I might it might be worth it for me to change some of my tilled land over to timber and grow that. Even though it takes a long time to harvest, the price becomes high enough that it's worth it for me to change over some corn land into timber land. Another example of produce which doesn't always afford a rent is a metallic mine. Remember during Adam Smith's time, silver and gold are the primary money. So we spend a lot of time concentrating on these metallic mines. These mines will depend on the fertility like coal mines, but less on the situation than coal, less about the location. Because the value per pound is so high, you can afford to transport them. Long travel is worth it, whereas coal being so heavy and bulky compared to its cost, if it's in a bad location, it might not be worth it to mine that mine at all. It might be worth it just to leave it there. Because the rent of land with mines, these metallic mines, because of their ability to travel, rents end up being really low. They're actually governed by the most fertile mine in the world because I, I can go ahead and mine that for all it's worth because I'm willing to send it anywhere in the world 
because travel makes such a little cost compared to how much it's worth. Therefore, rent for a landlord makes up a small price of coarse metals and an even smaller price of precious metals. So something like tin or copper, rent makes up a small price. But as the value of the metal goes higher and higher to silver and gold, rent becomes even smaller, smaller portion of it because it travels so well. Most of the cost of a high value metal is labor and profit and very little is rent. A landlord can't make a lot of money on a metallic mine. The lowest price you could sell a precious metal for, the lowest price you'd be able to sell gold for is just like any other good. The lowest possible price is the cost to replace the stock or capital you put in plus ordinary profits. I need to pay the wages of everybody. I need to make my money back on all the tooling. If I'm not able to do that, it just won't get mined. So the, that's the lowest price it can be sold for. Otherwise, it just won't be taken out of the ground. The highest price is not necessarily determined by anything but actual scarcity. Basically, what I'm saying is gold and silver prices go up because there's not enough of it for everybody. And this demand, the reason that people want it, is partly from utility and partly from beauty. A lot of silver might be used not just for making things that I like to look at, not just for making rings or earrings or necklaces, but it'll also be used for useful things. I might need to use it for utensils. I might use it for making plating. It's used for all kinds of things. And here's a quote from Adam Smith. With the greater part of rich people, the chief enjoyment of riches consists in the parade of riches which in their eye is never so complete as when they appear to possess those decisive marks of opulence, which nobody can possess but themselves. Basically what we're saying is wealthy people like to show off their wealth, whether that's buying fancy cars, buying bigger houses, nicer clothes. But when it is at their height of enjoyment, is when it's something that's scarce that not everybody could have. Buying those unique items, buying those one-of-a-kind items. So in the same way, silver and gold don't only get their demand from beauty and utility, but also scarcity. These three, beauty, utility, and scarcity, are the original foundation of the high price of the metal before they're even used for money and coins. However, when we're using silver and gold for coins, it creates a new demand, making them even more scarce and increasing their value even more. Precious stones, you know, you think of emeralds, diamonds, rubies, they have the beauty portion, but not the utility. So in, in a metal, you have this utility along with the beauty, but you don't have that in precious stones. So grouped together, Precious metals and gem mines have their rent determined not by their absolute fertility. So not necessarily by how much easy silver there is to get to, how much easy rubies there are to get to. Really what it determines the amount of rent I can charge for it is the relative fertility to the most fertile mine. Because they travel so well, how much I can charge for rent doesn't depend on how good my mine is. It depends on how good my mine is compared to the best mine in the world because anywhere in the world, this gold will travel to. One way that you can see that this is true is when a new mine is discovered, let's say they find a new gold mine in Peru that is more fertile than any of the ones they found in Europe, the rent for all of the old mines end up dropping. Even with all this, finding these new fertile mines add, do not add very much wealth to the world. Because the value of precious metals and gems are so derived from their scarcity, it doesn't really add any wealth to find a new mine. When we find a new fertile mine, we end up producing a lot more, which leads to a loss in value because they're not as scarce anymore. So even though there's more gold, 
the value of what's out there goes down. We're really not adding any wealth to the world or our country by finding one of these new mines. In comparison, if you increase the fertility of land to produce more food, that increase doesn't only help the rent for the land, which is improved, but likewise increases to many other lands by creating new demand for their produce. If the country is able to produce food way better, we now free up that labor to make other things. We make the whole country more wealthy to afford more of these niceties, these better clothing, better furniture. In this last section, I want to cover the variation of value of root produce to each other and how it varies over time as the country is progressing. The first type of produce that I'll cover is the produce that humans can't affect the quantity of the supply. And the second one is where humans can increase the supply to meet the demand. The first one, not much we can do to increase the supply. These are nature's products that only a certain amount exist, and they're very perishable. There's not much that we as a country could do or we as the owner of the land could do to cause more production. Some examples might be rare birds, fish, or game. As the wealth and luxury of a nation increase, the supply stays the same, but the competition to purchase them goes up. These type of rude produce, the price of it is not limited by any certain boundary. So one example I could give in modern society is like the tuna that is sold in markets in Asia or Japan and America. There are certain types of rare tuna to get some high quality where the prices just jump and there really doesn't seem to be any bounds to them. But what's more interesting is when we look at the rude produce that human ingenuity and concentration can increase the supply to meet the demand. So these are some of the conditions that would put produce in this category. These, the type, these types of produce would have little to no value in an uncultivated country. During the progress of the country, the quantity of these go down while the demand increases. Their real value, the quantity of labor they'll be able to purchase, will gradually rise as this happens. Once their real value is high enough, the rude produce becomes profitable enough, profitable as anything we can put on fertile land. Once it reaches this point of profitability, it'll go no higher. So once, once the produce has reached this price, if the price was any higher, we would end up changing over some of the tilled land to produce more of it. So let me give some concrete examples. Cattle price increases until it's high enough that it now becomes more profitable to produce food for cattle than for human food. Once cattle prices are this high, they'll not go any higher. Otherwise, if the cattle prices went higher, people would end up turning land from tilled corn back into pastures. They'd, be in, they'd stop producing corn for humans, and they'll be like, we need to now have more land to graze on. Cattle's usually the second root produce after corn that goes through this process that I just talked about. Poultry is usually the one that's next after cattle and corn. Usually, poultry, a chicken, start out on a farm because they don't cost the farmer anything. They only eat the scraps that are left on the ground. They'd eat worms, all stuff that would normally be a waste to the farmer. And for this reason, growing chickens on a farm ends up just being pure gain. If I have one or two chickens running around my farm... I can butcher and eat those, and it doesn't cost me anything. As the wealth of the country increases, with poultry being rare, people want to buy it 
until it becomes profitable enough to actually farm chickens. Once it reaches this price, it can't go any higher because if the cost of poultry went higher, farmers or landlords would end up turning their pastures or tilled land over into chicken farms. So in the same way that cattle prices are bound by corn prices, poultry prices are bound by cattle prices and corn prices. In general, this process of improvement happens with all of these sorts of produce. There, this animal food is the highest just before we start cultivating land to farm them. Before they are farmed, the scarcity of that animal raises the price or of that root produce or that product. Once it reaches this, once it reaches a price that's high enough, we start making farms for them. We start farming specifically for chickens. We, if I had ham prices going up, I'm going to make more hog farms and I might, instead of having a cornfield here, throw a hog farm there. Or instead of raising chickens, raise hogs. After they're being farmed, farmers end up coming up with new methods of feeding that will allow the farmer to raise more with the same quantity of food. For this reason, prices fall with the increased supply and the improvements also allow them to sell it cheaper. The same process that we saw that I talked about with chickens in more depth can be seen with hogs and dairy and other produce. They start out on a farm as pure gain, as a save all for the farmer, where it doesn't cost them anything to raise them. And then as the prices go up, you end up seeing dedicated hog farms, de dedicated dairy farms. The price of any of these types of rude produce must first be sufficient to pay the rent of good land. So the price to raise chickens, the price to raise hogs needs to be high enough. It needs to be as high as me growing corn on that land or me using it as a pasture. And they secondly need to be high enough to pay the labor and expense to the farmer, which are common to good corn land. This is a bit of a long chapter, so I'm going to sum it up, summarize it up. In conclusion, every improvement of society will either directly or indirectly raise the rent for the landlord. Improving cultivation or even increasing the quantity of useful labor employed will raise the rents for the landlord, and the opposites will make the rent go down. And if you remember, we're sort of at the end of book one of Wealth of Nations. And if you remember, we went through, there's three parts to every piece of produce that a country has. Rent, wages, and profits. All the revenue, all the GDP is broken down into these three parts. We just covered in this chapter how rent is naturally and strictly connected to society's improvement. Therefore, landlords can never mislead regulation to help themselves without helping society. Wages, the second part, like rent, are connected in the same way to an improving society. Laborers will get more wages through a continually rising improvement of the country. Landlords may gain more by society's improvement than laborers. However, no one is affected more by a decline of society than the people that live on wages. And the final order of society are the employers who live by profit. This is actually the only portion of society which does not rise with the prosperity of the country. On the contrary, profits are naturally lowest in wealthy countries and high in poor ones. Therefore, it's not in the employer's interest to have the best interest for society. This is made even more dangerous because usually the amount of wealth that employers have draw the most public consideration. Politicians and regulations are looking to employers for what they should do. It's in the employer's best interest to widen the market and decrease competition. To widen the market may be good for the public, may be good for society, 
but to decrease competition always hurts the public. For this reason, Adam Smith gives this quote, the proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order of society, employers, ought always to be listened to with great precaution. The interests of employers is most served to deceive and even op oppress the public. So again, there's three parts to the produce of a country, rent, wages, and profits. Rent and wages are linked in with an improving society. Employers are opposite. I want to thank you guys for listening in today to this episode of the Nerd Assassin podcast. If you guys have any more questions, concerns, or want to continue the conversation, reach out to the Nerd Assassin on LinkedIn or Twitter. Otherwise, make sure to give me feedback by reviewing the podcast on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. Have a nice day.